Good morning, and welcome to worship for Nobleton Schomburg Pastoral Charge. My name is Pat Edmonds, and I'm a licensed lay worship leader serving in Shining Waters Region. I welcome you to this virtual service. February is Black History Month, officially recognized in Canada since 1996. This is a time to honor the contributions and struggles of people of African descent. I encourage all of you to check the United Church of Canada website for information and avail yourself of the opportunities provided in the media to become better educated about black history. Let us begin with a prayer written by Lydia Smith, taken from Parables, Prayers, and Promises. Let us pray. God, we hold in prayer our struggles to untangle the mess created by our individual and communal brokenness. The stereotypes, biases, and systemic forms of injustice that enmesh, confine, and block us from being in right relations with each other. We invite your forgiving, reconciling, and transforming grace to be with us as we attempt to unravel the systems of injustice, violence, and hatred that we have created with our misguided prejudices and fears. Amen. The hymns today are of the sing-along variety, so please sing out as loudly as you like wherever you are. Although I give the hymn book reference, sometimes in the recordings the words are slightly different, so I include them here. Also, please join in the responsive parts of the service indicated by the bold print. At this time, let us acknowledge that we are worshiping on the ancestral lands of the indigenous peoples of this area. We live, work, play, and pray on these treaty lands. May we live in harmony and respect with all those who share the land with us and be thankful to God as we move into a peaceful and healthy future together. The Christ candle has been lit. Its light is a wonderful gift, illuminating the spaces we are in. We gather knowing wherever we are, Christ is with us. And our opening hymn today comes from More Voices number 97, Listen, God is Calling. Please join me in the responsive call to worship. We join virtually, but are gathered together in God's love. 
Let us open ourselves to God's unconditional love. Awaken us to discover the uniqueness of God's love and forgiveness. Let us be encouraged to recognize and relish the opportunities for helping, healing, and forgiveness. Enlivened by the ever-present Holy Spirit, may we worship together. And our opening prayer is also responsive. Come closer to us, O God. Reconcile us to our brothers and sisters. Come closer to us, O God. Care for our aging generations. Come closer to us, O God. Protect us from future famine. Come closer to us, O God. Draw us nearer to each other through you. Embrace with us, weep with us, that we may be family again. Amen. And let us confess our sins to God in unison, our prayer of confession. Merciful one, we are not what we wish we were. We are often only what we desire. We are love when we love one another. We are strife when we judge the other as less worthy than ourselves. We are how we consider the other. Help us, O oh God, to be so much more, more in whom we are, more in how we act, more in what we dream, more in how we love. Let us become the more that you intended in your divine image. Amen. God is the salvation of the righteous, our refuge in the time of trouble. God helps us, rescues us, and leads us into the bright day of justice and mercy. Amen. Let us pray. Forgiving God, grant us ears to hear your particular word for us this day, both your guidance and your promise. May our hearts, minds, and responses be acceptable and life-giving. Amen. And our first scripture today is responsive Psalm number 32 found in Voices United on page 759. Blessed are those whose offenses are forgiven, whose sin has been put away. Blessed are those to whom God imputes no guilt and who, in whose spirit there is no deceit. When I kept silence, my body wasted away while I groaned all the day long. For your hand was heavy upon me day and night. My strength dried up as in a summer drought. Then I acknowledged my sin to you. My guilt I did not hide. I said, I will confess my sins to God, and you forgave the guilt of my sin. Therefore, let all the faithful pray to you in time of trouble. When great flood water rises, it shall not come near them. You are a hiding place for me. You will preserve me from trouble. You will surround me with shouts of deliverance. I will teach you and guide you in the way you should go. I will keep you under my eye and instruct you. Be not like a horse or a mule without understanding, whose course must be checked with bit and bridle. Many pains are in store for the wicked, but whoever trusts in God is surrounded by steadfast love. And I've chosen to focus today on an Old Testament lesson, the ongoing story of Joseph and his brothers, from Genesis chapter 45, verses 3 to 15. 
Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still alive? But his brothers could not answer him, so dismayed were they at his presence. Then Joseph said to his brothers, Come closer to me. And they came closer. He said, I am your brother Joseph, whom you sold into Egypt. And now do not be distressed or angry with yourselves because you sold me here. For God sent me before you to preserve life. For the famine has been in the land these two years, and there are five more years in which there will be neither plowing nor harvest. God sent me before you to preserve for you a remnant on earth and to keep alive for you many survivors. So it was not you who sent me here, but God. He has made me a father to Pharaoh and lord of all his house and ruler over all the land of Egypt. Hurry and go up to my father and say to him, Thus says your son Joseph, God has made me lord of all Egypt. Come down to me, do not delay. You shall settle in the land of Goshen, and you shall be near me, you and your children and your children's children, as well as your flocks, your herds, and all that you have. I will provide for you there, since there are five more years of famine to come, so that you and your household and all that you have will not come to poverty. And now your eyes and the eyes of my brother Benjamin see that it is my own mouth that speaks to you. You must tell my father how greatly I am honored in Egypt and all that you have seen. Hurry and bring my father down here. Then he fell upon his brother Benjamin's neck and wept while Benjamin wept upon his neck, and he kissed all his brothers and wept upon them, and after that his brothers talked with him. Thanks be to God for the Holy Word. As we celebrate Black History Month and cope with the knowledge of many unmarked graves of Indigenous children, I chose an anthem today titled, You Value Each of Us the Same, sung by Jim and Jean Strathdy. the same so you endured the 
I don't often choose the Old Testament passage as the focus scripture for the day, but this 45th chapter of Genesis is one of the most powerful and emotional scenes in the entire Old Testament. Joseph's reunion with his brothers is dramatic. First, the brothers do not recognize Joseph, the young lad they sold into slavery years ago but Joseph recognizes them. This brings Joseph's emotions to the surface. Second, the tables of power have turned. The brothers have traveled to Egypt to beg for food. It is now Joseph who holds the power of life and death over his brothers, as they once held over him. Third, we recall how Joseph toyed with his brothers in the three previous chapters, pretending not to know them, accusing them of theft, engineered by him, and insisting that they return with Benjamin, the youngest brother. These actions cause the reader to wonder how the rest of the story of Joseph and his brothers will play out. We cannot wait to see what Joseph will do. What will be his next move in this dysfunctional family and its complex relationships? The tension builds up in chapters 42 to 44 and is finally released in the beginning verses of this chapter. Joseph can no longer control himself. He is entirely vulnerable in the process. This is clearly one of those life-changing, pivotal moments when the very air in the room is charged with the significance of what is happening. He tells his servants to leave the room and tells his brothers who he is. In fact, so emotional is Joseph that he sobs loudly loudly enough for the Egyptians outside the room to hear. Joseph reveals himself and asks his brothers to come closer. They do come closer, and the miracle of reconciliation happens. Joseph forgives his brothers and reaches out to them in love. The story of Joseph explores familiar human traits and family relationships. By overcoming his hurt and anger, by forgiving his brothers and saving them from starvation, Joseph gives all of us hope for reconciliation. It would have been natural for Joseph to act out of revenge and anger. Revenge would be consistent with our sinful human nature. Instead, Joseph chooses the way of God and forgives them. This powerful moment in Scripture can give us new hope for reconciliation, not just in our families, but in our communities and in our world. Joseph set aside power and revenge and chose forgiveness and compassion. What would happen if individuals, political parties, or nations would act in the same way? 
A few years ago, I preached a sermon about forgiveness on September 11th, an anniversary of 9-11, the day forever etched in the minds of all North Americans and people worldwide. As the news reports flooded in throughout the day, and in the weeks to follow, and the death toll of ordinary citizens and rescue personnel mounted, we were all flooded with emotions, strong emotions, shock, anger, grief, rage, hurt, confusion, fear, and overwhelming sadness. We wanted to strike out in anger, hit something, or go hide in a cave away from all the terrible news reports and images of the destruction and loss of life. Collectively, we were crushed, overwhelmed, numb, frozen, blown away with grief and filled with fear. We felt violated. We realized that no place on earth was safe from the deeds of evil man, and many of us were overcome with a horrible sense of hopelessness. What could we possibly do in the face of this? Well, I'm sure the last thing that entered our minds was forgive. Revenge, retribution, punishment, perhaps, but forgiveness? I doubt it. We experience an almost instinctual response to injustice. When someone is oppressed, harmed, or victimized, our gut tells us that those responsible must be punished. Even the most spiritual, faith-filled individuals probably never thought of forgiveness. But Jesus said long ago that an eye for an eye justice is old news and no longer the way to true reconciliation. The way of forgiveness may be more challenging, but it leads to a deeper, more satisfying outcome for everybody. Some wrongs are easy to forgive. Other wrongs where we have been used, abused, degraded, shaken to the very core of our being, as on 9-11, are very hard to forgive, even when we know God desires us to do so. An acquaintance of mine once shared his story of terrible abuse at the hands of his father. As soon as he was able, he left home and never saw his father again. His father died a premature death, partly as a result of alcohol abuse. Years later, my friend returned to his hometown and went to the cemetery to visit his father's grave. As he stood there, he felt stirred to say out loud, I forgive you. The overwhelming sense of peace that flooded his soul with those three simple words was indescribable. The weight of the world was instantly lifted from his shoulders. He felt free at last. He credits this experience for leading him to pursue a life of service in the ministry. There is an essential and mysterious ingredient to forgiveness that comes from a divine source. We can have the desire to forgive someone, 
but it remains unplanted in our souls until God enters in. There is no mistaking the moment when it all comes together and a remarkable peace washes over us as forgiveness flows from a divinely touched source within each of us. Forgiveness provides one of those truly gracious opportunities for us to be co-creators with God as we create and forge deeper relationships. The will to forgive, combined with a prayerful appeal for God's grace, leads to something of a miracle, reconciliation. Although we may find as human beings that there may be a limit to our capacity for forgiveness, there is no limit whatsoever to the forgiveness and grace that God provides. When we choose to forgive, we choose to lay aside our right to extract revenge. When we choose the path of forgiveness, we leave ultimate justice and vengeance to God. Some would argue that when we choose this path, we're yielding all our power and will end up as doormats, being taken advantage of at every turn. But forgiveness is a powerful tool. Let me share a true story, a courtroom drama. A young offender was convicted of gunning down another person, execution style. The murderer had a bad record, was no stranger to the system, and only stared in anger as the jury returned its guilty verdict. The victim's family had attended every day of the two-week trial. On the day of the sentencing, the victim's mother and grandmother were invited to address the court. When they spoke, they did not address the jury. They spoke directly to the young offender. What did each of these women say? I forgive you. The older woman went on to say, You broke the first commandment, loving God with all your heart, mind, and soul. You broke the law, loving your neighbor as yourself. I am your neighbor, so you have my address. If you want to write, I'll write back. I sat in this trial for two weeks, and for the last 16 months, I tried to hate you, but I couldn't. I feel sorry for you because you made a wrong choice. For the first time since the trial began, the defendant's eyes lost their laser force and appeared to surrender to a greater force, nurturing unconditional love. After the grandmother finished speaking, the murderer sat, his head hanging low. There was no more swagger, no more icy stare. The destructive forces within him collapsed helplessly before this remarkable display of human love. In choosing the path of forgiveness, that grandmother unleashed a power that revenge and hatred could not. When we are hurt as individuals or as a society, our instinct is to grab a weapon and fight back. But the greatest weapon ever used to protect humanity was Jesus Christ, who came humbly riding on a donkey and in his last breath said, Father, forgive them. That's a powerful image in a world full of weapons 
of mass destruction. Thanks be to God. Amen. Let us sing together from Voices United, number 364, Forgive Our Sins As We Forgive. We thank all of you who have continued to support the work of the Pastoral Charge by giving your time, talent, and treasure throughout this unusual time. Our thanks also to Kim for distributing this service and for all of you who joined us this morning. Let us dedicate the offerings we have given this week. Merciful God, Bless our offerings as you have blessed our bodies and lives. Help us give more of ourselves, our hearts and resources to see your merciful love embodied in all of us. Amen. Let us pray now for the people of God's world and we will conclude by saying together the Lord's Prayer. Let us pray. Creator God, we trace your blessings with our eyes and hands, our hopes and memories. When we watch the evening news or read the morning paper, receive our distress and our anger, our hurt and our loss, and show us your tireless activity in the midst of our world. Use all our emotions to show us truth and help us work at developing strong relationships. 
Restore our ability to say yes to your good news when harsh choirs of no's drown out our timid cries of hope. Give us courage to apologize when we've injured and to forgive when the right time is before us. By the gentle touch of your spirit, help us to find a renewed sense of compassion that we may truly live as your people in service to all humanity. We pray for all those in our community and the world who are unwell in body, mind, and spirit. Be with those who are struggling with the restrictions and effects of this pandemic. Be with them and their families so they are aware of your healing presence. We pray for this community of faith and all others that are facing and finding creative ways to worship and stay connected with one another. We pray particularly for those we name now in our hearts. Be with each one of us as we go into another week. Bless us and keep us safe. We thank you and praise you as we ask all these things in the name of your Son, Jesus the Christ, who taught us to pray, saying together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Our closing hymn today from Voices United is number 266. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. There is no greater story of God's mercy, forgiveness, and grace than that of John Newton, a notorious slave trader whose life was transformed by God. John Newton became an Anglican cleric who wrote many hymns, the most well-known, Amazing Oh, 
God calls us to forgiveness. God calls us to live a life of freedom, peace, joy, and dignity for all our brothers and sisters around the world. Let us go into the world with God's eternal spirit that longs to bring the world back to God in joy. And may God, our Creator, Jesus, our Savior, and the ever-present Holy Spirit bless all our ministries until we meet again. Amen. And let us close with Go Now in Peace.